This evening we're continuing our overview of the Old Testament book titled 2 Samuel. But before we examine the events found here in 2 Samuel chapter 11, I should take a moment to put our text back into its context. And so it'll help you to remember that King David was a man who had many excellent qualities, including a great faith in the Lord, as well as a love for the people of God. And yet at the same time, David was also a man of great weakness, especially when it came to the ladies. Remember, uh, we've already learned that David had seven wives. And not only that, but he also had several concubines. And so clearly, this was a man who struggled with lust. And in light of all of this, it should be obvious to us that David was a man uh, who was struggling with the sin of sexual morality. But rather than recognizing his sins and rather than repenting of them, David continued to pursue his own personal pleasures. And here in our text tonight, we find King David, he's sliding further down that slippery slope of sexual immorality. As we make our way through this tough text, it's my hope that we're, we're all going to take some time to realize how easy it is for us to stumble into sexual sin. And not only that, but it's also my prayer that we become believers who uh, are making those disciplined decisions to safeguard our lives against the sins of sexual morality. And with this as our focus, I'd like you to turn your attention now to the events found here in 2 Samuel chapter 11. We'll pick up our study here at verse 1. Here we learn that it happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and then besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. Now here in these verses we find David, who, remember, was engaging and and practicing polygamy. He had multiple wives, as I've already pointed out, and and as if seven wives weren't already six too many, he, he decided to engage in the act of adultery. And as we consider the decisions that led up to this sin of sexual immorality, it's my hope that we'll see how easy it is for any one of us to make the same sort of mistake. And with this as our our focus, we should notice again there in verse 1 where we learn that David engaged in this act of adultery in the spring of the year, which we learn here was the time when kings go out to battle. As you already know, the winter months are cold and they're wet and, and completely unsuitable for war. Therefore, ancient armies would wait until spring to attack their enemies because it was just more conducive to warfare. And seeing how this was the time when the kings would go out to battle, then it only stands to reason that King David should have been the one leading his troops against the Ammonites. However, he didn't. He, he, he stayed in Jerusalem and he sent Joab in his place. And there at the end of verse 1, we learn that David remained in Jerusalem. And so this period of time when the kings were going out to battle, King David, he stays home. We aren't given a reason for David's decision to remain there in Jerusalem, but what we do know is that he wasn't leading the people according to his kingly calling. He wasn't doing what the Lord had raised him up to do. And it's sad to say that David's decision to disregard his royal responsibilities provided him with this idle time which resulted in this act of adultery. As a matter of fact, look with me again there at verse 2. Here we learn that it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. Clearly, he was having a hard time sleeping. And it was there from the vantage point of his roof that he saw this woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. Now, it goes without saying that had David been on the battlefield, then he would have been where he was supposed to be. And if he would have been where he was supposed to be, then he wouldn't have been watching a woman bathing from his rooftop. At the same time, I would also argue that David, though he found himself in this situation, he still bore the responsibility of looking away. 
There he is on his rooftop. There's a, a woman clearly bathing in the nighttime because it's probably, uh, you know, just uh, better for her because n- not everybody's up. And so uh, she's probably thinking that she's having this private moment, you know, being clean. And, 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 but there's David being dirty. He's being dirty. He's, he's from his rooftop vantage point watching this woman bathe. And, and he should have looked away, but instead he stared at her like a pervert. What's even worse is that this man, who again already has seven wives, he decides to pursue this married woman. As a matter of fact, look with me again there at verse 3. Here we learn that David sent and inquired about the woman. In other words, David not only chose to stare at her rather than looking away as he should have, but he sends someone out to go and find out who she is. And there in the middle of verse 3, we find David discovering that the woman's name was Bathsheba, and not only that, but she's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. He finds out that she's married. Sadly, this information didn't stop him from entertaining his sinful desires. As a matter of fact, there in verse 4, we find David making another sinful decision. He continues sliding down this slippery slope of sexual immorality by sending messengers to bring Bathsheba to his home, and it's sad to say that, that she said yes. Notice with me again there at verse 4, where we learn that she came to him and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity and she returned to her house. Here in this verse, we're presented with this contrast between Bathsheba's physical purity and her spiritual impurity. In order to explain explain what I mean by that, it'll help you understand that a Jewish woman was considered to be unclean during the time of her monthly cycle, and anyone engaging in a physical relationship with a woman during that time would also become unclean until evening. In light of this law, it's interesting to me that David and Bathsheba were both concerned about her physical purity, all the while gearing up for engaging in sexual immorality. Well, you don't want to engage in sexual immorality in an impure way. What kind of sense does that make? Zero, none, it makes no sense. And yet that's exactly what happened here. It's true that she was physically clean when she arrived at David's house, but she departed spiritually unclean after engaging in this act of adultery. And listen, the sin of sexual morality not only compromised the lives of David and Bathsheba, but we must understand that the sins of sexual morality will also corrupt our lives as well if we allow ourselves to go down that same path. In order to prove my point, if you would hold your place here in the book of 2 Samuel, And turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where we find Paul. He's presenting us with God's point of view when it comes to sexual sins. As you make your way to 1 Corinthians 6, I want to take a moment to point out that the Lord is the one who created the pleasure that we experience within the sexual relationship. And so I'm here to tell you that God is not opposed to the sexual intimacy that we enjoy within the context of a, a bibliocentric marital relationship. In other words, a marriage between a man and a woman, uh, according to uh, the revelation of God's word. God's not opposed to sexual intimacy between uh, a man and his wife. At the same time, though, we must understand that every sort of sexual immorality is nothing more than a degradation of God's original design. And it's sad to say that many lives have been ruined simply because of sexual morality. This was precisely the point that Paul was making here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you would look with me there, we'll begin in the middle of verse 13 where Paul declares, Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you and whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Here in these verses we find Paul, he's warning the Christians in Corinth about the 
the, the sin of sexual immorality. And as we examine this warning, we must not fail to realize that those who engage in the sin, uh, sins of sexual morality, uh, they're, they're not only sinning against you know, the Lord, but they're sinning against their own body. Now, just to be perfectly clear about all of this, uh, it's important to understand that the term sexual immorality, it's translated from the Greek word pornea, which not only refers to pornography, but it also refers to adultery, it refers to premarital sex, it refers to homosexuality, it refers to lesbianism, it, it refers to bestiality. All, all of these are examples of sexual immorality. You see, uh, sexual intimacy is designed uh, to be something that's enjoyed between a, a man and his wife. Everything else, it's sexual immorality. And it's sad to say that there are many who are destroying their lives by engaging in these sorts of sexual sins. In order to further explain what I'm talking about, let's make our way back to 2 Samuel chapter 11. I want to pick up our study there at verse 5, because here we learn that the woman conceived, so she sent and told David and said, I am with child. Here in this verse, we learn about Bathsheba's unplanned pregnancy. And based on this, we can assume then that a month had probably passed by when she finally realized that she was pregnant. It was at that moment when she realized that her husband, Uriah, who was away at war, well, he was going to find out about her affair. Remember, Uriah was a soldier. He was on the battlefield at the time of Bathsheba's conception. And in light of all this, I can't help but to remember what Moses said in Numbers chapter 32. There, he encouraged the people of Israel to take note because those who sin against the Lord can be sure that their sin will find them out. Don't be confused. Because so oftentimes we engage in sin thinking, oh, no one will ever find out about this. But Moses assures us that our sins will find us out. It might not be today, it might not be tomorrow, but it surely will find us out. Sadly, we live in a day and an age uh, when unplanned pregnancies, uh, they're easily dealt with. And, and those who don't want to be exposed can just go and have their child aborted. And with that being the case, many feel a freedom to engage in sexual immorality. And the reason why is because abortion doctors have duped many women into believing that the embryo within their womb is nothing more than a mass of cells which can be re removed, much like some sort of unwanted tumor. And, and so women feel this freedom to, you know, if they get pregnant and they don't want to be exposed and they don't want to be found out and they don't want to deal with this unplanned pregnancy, they can just have this, this mass of cells cut away. Now, in light of that point of view that uh, America, by and large, ha has been duped into, into believing, I want to consider again something that Bathsheba says to David here in verse 5. Notice again where she says, uh, actually, we, we read here that the woman conceived... So she sent and told David and said, I am with a mass of cells. No, that's not what it says. I am with child. I am with child. She conceives and says, I am with child. And, and please understand, she's letting David know that she was pregnant, which is based on this concept that the womb actually contains a child. Christian, listen, if, if you have a question at this point in time about whether life begins at conception or does it begin at birth, I would encourage you to examine the scriptures so that we can gain uh, the perspective of the one who created life. Because there's all sorts of arguments out there, and some say, well, life begins at conception. Some say, well, when, when there's brain activity. Some say that it, you know, it's not life until it's viable. And, and, and there's all these different arguments floating around. And at the end of the day, I would simply point out that the only opinion that matters is God's. People can make the strongest arguments and they can sound so positive and they can act like they know what they're talking about. But at the end of the day, the one opinion that matters is God's opinion. So the question is, what does God say? And if you do a study on this, if you study the scriptures and look at how often uh, we see the concept of conception and life together, uh, we have to walk away with the conclusion that the God of the Bible believes that life begins at conception, period. Life begins at conception, according to God. Therefore, the mother who engages in the act of abortion is actually taking the life of their child. 
Now, having said that, I, I just want to assure you, if you're a woman who was duped into believing that you were simply removing a mass of cells and, and you made that mistake and now you're grieving uh, every day because of that, please trust me when I tell you that we serve a gracious God. We serve a gracious God who is ready to forgive the repentant. And, and if you've since placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm here to remind you that old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And not only that, uh, but I must insist that you're going to eventually meet your child in heaven. And that's good news. That's good news for, for the women who are grieving because they were duped into having an abortion. At the same time, though, I must insist that every Christian should be pro-life. And the reason why is because abortion is tantamount to murder. It's plain and simple. Abortion is tantamount to murder. And, and the woman who aborts their baby is taking the life of their child. Now, I realize that abortion advocates are quick to insist that women should have the right to make decisions about their own bodies, and I agree. Women should completely have the right to make decisions about their own bodies. That being said, it's important to point out that the fetus is not their body. The fetus is another body altogether. It's the body of their child. And a woman does not have the right to make those decisions about whether that second body within them or, or third and fourth, depending on how many children they're about to have, they don't have a right to make a decision about the life of the child in their womb. That's another body altogether, and therefore the pregnant woman has no right to end the life of the child growing within them. Tragically, though, there are have been close to 60 million abortions here in America since the Supreme Court ruling of Roe v. Wade back in 1973. Just wrap your mind around that. Just get your mind around that, that number real quick. Almost 60 million babies aborted within 44 years. 44 years. 60 million babies. And listen, you know, I, I, I hear all the arguments. Well, what if, you know, what about rape? And what about... Listen, the majority of these abortions occurred simply because of an unplanned pregnancy which was conceived through sexual immorality. That's the, that's the bulk of these abortions. And, and we can continue talking about, you know, what, what about in the case of incest? What about in the case of rape? And I would simply ask, well, why, why should the child be punished for what that child's father did? Why should the child be killed because the child's father was a sinner? It doesn't make sense. All of this, uh, to, just to say, I, I just recognize here that sexual immorality ruins lives. Plain and simple. And, and we're just dealing with the topic of abortion. I mean, we're not even talking about you know, sexually transmitted diseases. We're not talking about divorces that are caused because of, of adultery. And I mean, we could go down the list of all the lives that have been ruined because of sexual immorality. Therefore, we would do well just to follow the biblical advice of abstaining from it, fleeing from sexual immorality because sexual immorality ruins lives. In order to further prove my point, let's take a moment to consider how David's act of adultery ends up ruining Uriah's life. You would look with me there at 2 Samuel chapter 11. We'll pick up at verse 6 where we learn that David sent to Joab saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house and a gift of food from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. So when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Did you not come from a journey? Why do you not go down to your own house? And Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Here in these verses, we can see that David was hoping to avoid the complications of Bathsheba's unplanned pregnancy. And he did this by providing her husband with the opportunity to come home and spend some time with his wife. And, and what he failed to realize is that Uriah was a man of great integrity. 
He refused to be intimate with his wife while his compatriots were out there on the battlefield. And this was something that David wasn't expecting. As a result, David sets out to get Uriah drunk so that he might forget about his integrity. And as a matter of fact, look with me there at verse 12. Here we learn that David said to Uriah, Wait here today also, and tomorrow I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now when David called him, he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. And at evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. Now, here in these verses we find David, he's sinning again against Uriah, and he does this by getting him drunk. He, he gets him drunk so that he might go home and be intimate with his wife. And in order to explain what I'm saying uh, as this being a sin, I, I want to consider the words of the prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk declares in, in, in the second chapter of his book, he says, Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your bottle even to make him drunk. Based on this, we can see that David was sinning against Uriah by pressing the bottle to him so that he might get drunk. And yet even in this state of intoxication, Uriah still refused to spend the night with his own wife. Sadly, Uriah's attempt to be a man of integrity resulted in his untimely death. And with this in mind, look with me there at verse 14. Here we read in the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. So it was while Joab besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were, were valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab. And some of the people, the servants of David, fell, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Here in these verses, we find David attempting to cover up his act of adultery by conspiring to kill Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. And he even sent this message by Uriah's own hand. And in order to accomplish his murderous plan, he asks his cousin Joab to become complicit. He, he wants Joab to be a complicit conspirator in the death of Uriah. And it's sad to say that Joab was willing to comply with the sinful request of the king. And not only was he a complicit conspirator, but he was also willing to sacrifice the lives of other men under his command in order to accomplish David's desire. As a matter of fact, look with me there beginning at verse 18. Here we learn that Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war and charged the messenger saying, when you have finished telling the matters of the war to the king, if it happens that the king's wrath rises and he says to you, why did you approach so near the city when you fought? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who struck Abimelech, the son of Jerubasheth? Was it not a woman who cast a piece of millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you go near the wall? Then you shall say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent by him. And the messenger said to David, surely the men prevailed against us and came out to us in the field. Then we drove them back as far as the entrance of the gate. The archers shot from the wall at your servants. And some of the king's servants are dead. And your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it. So encourage him. Here in these verses we find Joab, he's sending word back to David that Uriah the Hittite was dead. The conspiracy was complete. And it's sad to say here that there were other Israelites who ended up dying just so that the unrighteous request of King David could be accomplished. And, and as some men pulled back, there, there were several that remained in order to win this fight, and yet they all died simply because David and Joab decided to murder Uriah. Chances are Joab didn't want it to look like Uriah's death was an act of sabotage, so he ends up sacrificing the lives of several other men just to help his cousin David out. And as we consider the way in which David was using Joab to help him cover up his adulterous relationship, I can't help but to think of something that Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It's verse 11 where Paul declares, I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. Christian, listen, the Lord has called us to break fellowship 
with any believer who is choosing to engage in a life of unrepentant sin. And please trust me when I tell you, I'm, I'm not talking about those who are struggling against their sexual desires. I'm talking about those who are fully given over to it, those who have no desire to repent of it at all. If you know a Christian who is refusing to repent of sexual immorality, I would encourage you to take Paul's advice by separating yourself from their influence because if you don't separate yourself from them, you might become the next Joab, complicit in covering up sexual sin. Separate yourself from them if they're choosing to live in unrepentant sin. We should have nothing to do with them. Not only that, but we should also avoid them because, listen, they're living a life that is displeasing to the Lord. And in order to prove my point, look with me there beginning at verse 26. Here we read, when the wife of Uriah heard that, Ur that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Here in the final verses of this chapter, we find Bathsheba, she's mourning the loss of her husband, and, and while it's my guess that she knew nothing about David's conspiracy to kill Uriah, uh, the fact is that the Lord knew everything about it. She probably couldn't imagine that David would have done anything like this, and yet the Lord knew exactly what he had done. The Lord knew everything about David's sins, and he was completely displeased with David. That word displeased well, it's translated from a Hebrew word which speaks of grief. And based on this, we can see that David had grieved the heart of God. David had grieved the heart of God and, and, and because of his sexual sin, because he had become, you know, uh, murderous, you know. It, and not only that, because David was destroying the lives of the people around him. David was ruining people's lives just simply because he was a man of a sexual appetite and refused to live according to the law of God. I'm here to tell you that the same will be true for everyone who is choosing to engage in a, in a life of sexual sin. It's displeasing to the Lord. Please trust me when I tell you that the passing pleasure of sexual sin, it isn't worth the damage that's caused when we find ourselves on, on, on the, the receiving end of the Lord's punishment. And, and trust me when I tell you that the passing pleasure of sin, it isn't worth the damage that's caused when our depravity destroys the lives of the people around us. It's not worth it. And, and, and you know, as I talk about, you know, lives being destroyed, you might be thinking, well, that's just way too extreme. Lives being destroyed, come on, that's, that's too much. If that's what you think, I, I encourage you to do some research. I, I would encourage you to go and spend some time regarding the statistics surrounding topics such as sexually transmitted diseases and how people's lives are ruined by STDs alone. I would encourage you to consider you know, how many lives are ruined because of abortion. I would encourage you to do some research and find out the effects of divorce on children and to see how lives are being ruined uh, simply because of the divorces that occur after adultery. Go do the research and you'll see that billions of lives have been destroyed, have been ruined simply because somebody wanted to engage in sexual immorality. Yeah, I, I'm serious. Lives are destroyed by sexual immorality. You know, just, just go and, and, and do some research on, on the lives of those, uh, you know, who engaged in the pornography business or those who engage in, in, in prostitution and, and, and what their life is like after the fact. Lives are ruined by sexual immorality. And, and if what we're saying is that, well, my sexual pleasure is way more important than any ruined lives, then we need to check our hearts. We need to check our hearts. And would it be to God that we would have that passion to say, you know what, the passing pleasure of sexual immorality is not worth the ruined lives that will result. It's not worth it. That being the case, I implore you to embrace the encouragement that Paul presented to the Christians in Thessalonica. It's 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3, where he declares, This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. 
If I go to any church USA and say, okay, Christians, hands up, who wants to know the will of God? Every hand will go up. Well, here it is. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. There's God's will for your life. There it is. If you're a single, then God's will for you is to maintain physical purity through sexual abstinence. That's God's will for you. If you're married, God's will for you is that you maintain the purity of your marriage by keeping the covenant that you made with your spouse. By avoiding every act of adultery. That's God's will for you. And with this as our goal, I encourage you to make sure that you're, you're beginning this purity by first guarding the gates of your mind. In order to explain what I mean by that, I'll, I'll remind you that the path that led to David's adultery, it began on the roof of his house. I would even say it began before that when he decided not to do what God was calling him to do. He was supposed to go to, and lead the army of Israel to battle against the Ammonites, and he didn't. Sent Joab instead, and then he couldn't sleep. Next thing you know, he's up on the roof of his house, and he's watching some gal bathing. That's where the path towards adultery began. for this very reason that the Lord Jesus encourages us to guard the gates of our minds by, by declaring you have heard that it was said to those of old you shall not commit adultery but I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart that's serious business the Lord Jesus is saying you need to guard those eye gates you need to guard those ear gates you need to guard your mind against those lustful thoughts that will lead you to a path towards sexual immorality. It's possible that you're here tonight and you're the one who's been up late at night standing on the rooftop. And by that, what I mean to say is that maybe you're the one who's been going online looking at the wrong websites, maybe you've been look, you know, ordering the wrong magazines, maybe you're going to the wrong clubs. Maybe you're watching the wrong movies. You're standing on the rooftop and you're feeding your lustful desires by looking at the Bathshebas of the world. And if this is true of you, I encourage you tonight, repent before you destroy people's lives. Repent before you find yourself at the wrong place with the wrong person doing the wrong thing and then attempting to cover it up. Repent before you find yourself with, with an STD for the rest of your life or an unplanned pregnancy that, that you can't afford or, or, or you know, thinking through how you can cover this up through abortion or whatever the case is. Don't, don't go down that path. Just stay off the roof. And, and keep your nose in the, in the word of God and, and study God's word and allow his word to change your life and change your desires and turn you into the believer that he wants you to become. Just stay off the roof altogether. And if you find yourself there, repent before you find yourself sliding further down the slippery slope of sexual morality. 